You and Dr. Chan write briefly about the stress on the dialysis workforce as especially the U.S. dialysis population continues to grow. How profound of a problem is that relative to the conventional model of dialyzing three times a week in a center? If you look forward 10 years, there's going to be upwards to 650,000 dialysis patients. So it's like 40% more dialysis patients. That means that you're going to have to build 3,000 more dialysis units. You'll need 40% more nephrologists, nurses, technicians. The labor force just isn't there. So the alternative that you sort of face is, well, is there another way of doing the therapy that provides the care and even a better quality of care, but it actually uses less staff? Because you're not going to have the staff anyway. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of uh, recognize if that's what's coming, then you have to realize that if you don't start experimenting with what you're going to do pretty soon, mm -hmm. you will be faced with this ever-increasing pressure of more and more people to take care of and an inability to actually uh, muster the resources to actually do that. In your article, you and Dr. Chan mention that there is a sort of complacency with the standard of care. So my question is, who exactly is complacent? Is it dialysis providers? Is it nephrologists? Or is it payers? Someone else? The dialysis providers have a very systematized way of taking care of the patients. It's a whole other dimension that if you started to ask, how would you change the way you currently staff units, the number of days a week that you have to do this, how you would actually plan the economic model as well as the care model? Well, this really disrupts the apple cart because they have a set of expectations uh, on how they do these things. And you'd have to say, well, wow, can we really operationalize that? So the complacency is, well, they're sort of used to this system. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's good, but, it's, but they're used to it. We know from registry data that rates of cardiovascular hospitalization have been decreasing for quite a while in dialysis patients. And increased, cardio, increased use of cardioprotective medications may be a culprit. My question is this, if the rates are falling, why do we need something else like intensive hemodialysis? Can't we just continue to progress along the curve? So one example that, we, uh, that I put in when I did the United States Renal Data System and this uh, uh, peer kidney care initiative is we looked at, well, yes, the heart failure hospitalizations are falling, but it just so happens that fluid overload hospitalizations were rising. Mm -hmm. And it's because the fluid overload hospitalizations are not included in a quality measure and the heart failure one is. So when I looked at them all together, they were actually pretty flat. Now that is in contrast to the general population where the progress has been spectacular, like 30%, 40% reductions in hospitalizations for heart attacks and heart failure and what have you. So the, the gap between the general population's care improving and the dialysis population's care is getting wider. It's not getting narrower. And that is a fundamental problem in the public health world where you have a population that's uniquely disadvantaged because some evolution in their care has not occurred compared to the general population. The nephrology community has been spending three or more decades searching for the magic kidney toxin. Mm -hmm. If we could only get rid of this stuff, life would be better and the patients would be all better and their hearts would be all better. And we have failed miserably at that. There are two things that actually are in nature that are so prevalent and so obvious, but we haven't dealt with them at all. Salt and water. It has been the issue for the last 50 years that we've been doing dialysis. It's always been about salt and water. It's the thing that causes fluid overload and heart failure and hypertension. And yet we continue to not deal with salt and water. And the only way you can deal with salt and water in a dialysis patient is time. You must have enough time to get it off. And that's where I think we're at now. We have the first studies that showed that you can make a benefit by increasing the number of treatments and the time in a week, and you got a positive outcome. And I take that data and I said, well, what am I going to do with this, with what I face right now? And I see right now we have an opportunity to make a difference in a subset of patients that would really benefit from this, and we're not using it and we could.